Welcome to this podcast series presented by the Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning at Sophia University. Sophia University is located in California and offers students a unique educational experience rooted in transformative, transpersonal education. The Center for Innovation in Teaching and Learning supports transformative education by creating engaged leaders and learners through resources, trainings, and events. This podcast series focuses on critical emerging issues in our communities. Today's podcast is a discussion with Dr. David Morelos on The Shadow in Transpersonal Psychology, interviewed by John Elfers. Dr. Morelos is the co-host, along with Dr. Jessica McCono, of the podcast series Psychology After Dark. He is a graduate of the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, where he earned his doctoral degree and has graciously agreed to share his reflections on his work in the far reaches of human nature. David, in your podcast series, you take a serious investigation of serial murder, wrongful convictions, unexplained and mysterious psi phenomena. You deconstruct the Sandy Hook shooting and the massacre at Waco, Texas, and the massacre at Jonestown, as well as addressing what really happened at the Salem witch trials. You do some debunking, as in your expose of the Stanford prison experiment, as well as many other topics. So this is a rather wide menu of topics, but collectively, they offer a fascinating investigation into human nature, or at least we could say into human behavior. They also address topics that many people find immensely fascinating on the one hand, or perhaps topics that people might choose to avoid. So I'm just wondering if we could open today with having you share a little bit about how you became fascinated with these topics and what really drew you to this work. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to start off by saying that it's great to be here. It's great to still be connected with uh, Sophia University and the Institute of Transpersonal Psychology, for which I still have a lot of affection for. And I have done some thinking about this question. I'm not exactly sure where that started. I guess I would say, you know, when I was thinking about this question before we started chatting, that there are maybe back in high school or uh, something like that, there are, you know, I was part of like that alternative crowd, I guess you could say. And I I sort of was, uh, you know, I played sports and stuff like that, but not a lot. I never felt really at home in, I guess what you would say would be the the mainstream sort of way that uh, students might go uh, in terms of like, okay, you have the, the jocks and that type of crowd. There was always, a, you know, there's always those who felt more at home with the alternative crowd, I guess you would say. And as I sort of progressed in high school, I sort of went that way. I got more involved in other things like uh, I wrote for the student newspaper. I was part of the drama club. Uh, I was on the knowledge bowl team. <laughs> so when you are sort of in that alternative crowd, you are faced with a bunch of these sort of topics, I guess. And that's sort of where the fascination really began, I, I guess you would say. Another part of it was, and I know that you and I had talked about it probably a few years ago now in one of your classes where it came up where my father had introduced me to the work of Carlos Castaneda. And I was hooked from the very beginning. And that that is probably more a testament to Castaneda's writing ability rather than whether what we know about how true or not Castaneda stories actually are. But it was sort of this opening into a whole interior world that I had never really considered. And what I loved about it the most was that there was this honoring of and an acceptance and an acknowledgement of a dark side of things. And when I say darkness, I don't mean to imply evil or bad or anything like that, but definitely a shadow side that is every bit as interesting, every bit as fascinating, every bit as deep 
as what we might call the light side of this sort of interior world that we're exploring. And when I first came across the topic of transpersonal psychology, when I was at Naropa, you know, and I didn't study transpersonal psychology while I was at Naropa because I was a writing and lit student. But while I was there, I knew a lot of people who were studying transpersonal psychology and they were the books that they were carrying around. And that's where I first came across the work of Ken Wilber, Stanislav Grof. And after I finished my degree there, I started basically reading everything transpersonal I could get my hands on. And so that's sort of where it started, I guess and how I sort of became attracted to it. And so you have these things that are sort of balancing out this dark side and being part of like the alternative crowd. And I guess you would say, which also included the goth kids and all that stuff in high school and that sort of fascination with darkness, but also where does this fit within a spiritual framework? Because I've always felt myself to be immensely drawn to spirituality in a number of different forms. And so I always felt that in order for it to be authentic, you sort of have to acknowledge that there are dark sides to this, or there are shadow dimensions to this. And I love that term. I love the term shadow because it really sort of zooms in on this is the unknown. This is the dark side of it. Again, not it doesn't read as evil for me or bad or anything necessarily like that. It just represents something that is unknown. Uh, and it represents a side that isn't um, necessarily looked at or appreciated as much, I would say. Yes. And it strikes me in hearing you talk that in transpersonal psychology, we tend to, if I can speak for the whole discipline, there does seem to be a stronger focus on spirituality of going into the light of bliss, uh, what I would call the more positive, uplifting dimension to human experience. And, and that's an area of experience that has been ignored and where transpersonal psychology really thrives. I agree. What I don't see happening, and this is why I find your work so interesting, is I don't see a lot of transpersonal theorists and researchers studying these topics that you are studying, like serial murderers. How does this fit in to the discipline of transpersonal psychology, which is why I appreciate your perspective on this. So I'm just wondering, how has this exploration enhanced your understanding of transpersonal psychology? So, you know, in studying the transpersonal, the question that I became fascinated with throughout the studies at Sophia, and even when I was doing my master's degree, which was a, a social science degree, was sort of like, okay, I was looking at the work of Wilbur and of Groff and of Walsh and Vaughn and a, a number of the big transpersonal theorists at the time and sort of saying to myself, if this is going to stand, it has to be applicable to to everything. It has to be, there has to be a statement. And, and I remember Ken Wilber saying it once too, and he was during a lecture or an interview, I believe, where he was talking about, okay, we need to have statements about different subjects. Like, you know, there, this is the transpersonal statement on criminal justice. This is the transpersonal statement on history. This is all these different topics. And so ever since then, it seems like there's been much more of a project to sort of expand. Well, what is the transpersonal vision for these different things? And so I really am trying to sort of help that, I guess you would say. I try to sort of expand on that. And so, okay, as you know, um, Jessica and I both work in a prison. And so for me, the real project has always been about integrating transpersonal psychology with what I do professionally. You know, I do substance abuse treatment. Jessica, does, she's a forensic psychologist. She does evaluations and stuff. But for me, it was how do I integrate this form of psychology and this sort of grounding philosophy that I believe in? And I've believed in for a very long time. How do I really integrate that with what I do professionally? Because the two seem so very at odds with each other. They seem very opposed to each other. You know, I work with criminals. I essentially wrestle dark energy all day, every day, and try to bring some light to it. So I have to acknowledge darkness. I have to. There, there is no, there's no getting around that. If I walked into the prison, you know, tomorrow when I go back to work with this very sort of pie in the sky, sunshine and rainbows, rose-colored glasses viewpoint, 
I would get laughed right out of the room. The, the inmates would label me as you don't understand anything about us or anything about our experiences or where we've been. And this is useless stuff. So it, it's become a really fascinating sort of journey for me. How do I take what I know or what I've learned about what I'm continuing to learn about transpersonal psychology and sort of integrate that? And not only for to give to the inmates, but also in my own personal journey, I'm weighing out these they're very different opposed viewpoints, like this very dark energy that I work with all day long versus the transpersonal and weighing them both out. But what I loved about the transpersonal when I really started to get into it is that I really did think, and I still continue to believe this, is that the transpersonal has a lot to say about that type of work. Very here and now, in the ditches type work, salt of the earth type stuff. I think transpersonal has a lot to say. I think there's a lot of potential in terms of using transpersonal concepts for work that we do that may not at first glance feel like it has anything to do with the substance abuse treatment of criminals or the, the treatment of sex offenders. So I think there's a lot of potential there. And that's one of those things that really, really fascinated me. And vice versa, on the other side of that is sort of bringing, how do I take this dark energy mm -hmm. that I work with every day and bring it into the transpersonal? Yeah, since so I think those are yeah, you know, those are the two directions that would be kind of fun to explore for a minute. So you're really dealing with these energies on a day to day basis, you know, 40 hours a week. So yeah, I'm imagining here you are, you're dealing with sex offenders and felons and criminals of all type. So let's say you have a coworker who's more mainstream traditional rehabilitation psychology. And then here's Dr. Morelos coming in, and he's a transpersonal psychologist. In what attitudes or what strategies might you bring to your encounters with inmates that say might be different, that might sort of brand you as bringing in that transpersonal perspective? That's a really good question. So I guess I would say that's where the the positive psychology flavor of transpersonal psychology really comes in helpful. I do get asked how I keep my inspiration going or my own sense of mission. And one of the ways that I do that is I love what I do. And I love what I do because I'm able to balance it in this way, I would think, with the darkness of working inside of a prison and working with the types of men that I work with and also having a larger vision and a larger context in which to put all this work into. And I really do credit the transpersonalist movement for helping me do that. And without getting, you know, into too much of a spiritual conversation, as I do believe that, you know, spirituality is a, is a personal choice, but what the transpersonal does is that it really bridges that gap between sort of positive psychology and spirituality. And it's really, it's helped me personally immensely just to continue to do this work, to believe that the work is important. It gives me uh, energy in the day to day and a lot of inspiration. And I think a lot of people see that, that I've worked with, see that embodied. And that's really what helps me get to other people and sort of gets that conversation going like, okay, well, how, how is it that you do what it is that you do? And you're still able to maintain this idea that I love my work. I want to pour my heart and soul into it. And I think that it, in a large part, it's creating meaning and creating meaning in work and the transpersonal, the study of the transpersonal for me has really, really helped that. Okay, that makes sense. So someone that you work with might look at you and think, there's really something about this guy who's working with me that it may be inspiring. A lot of it might be at a really subtle level because it's really an added, sounds like it's an attitude perspective framework that you're bringing to the work. Well, then let's put the arrow in the other direction and ask, what is it about the work that you do on a day-to-day -day level? What does this have to contribute to transpersonal psychology? In other words, what are some of the areas or dimensions of human nature that theorists and researchers in transpersonal psychology may not be looking at or may not be incorporating in their theories? So that's a, another really good question. Again, it gets back to this sort of darkness or shadow side component. You know, and that's also one of the interesting things about the transpersonal psychology. You know, I have a 
we both have PhDs in it. I know that I personally feel that there's still a tremendous amount of material and work that's been done that I, you know, I've only scratched the surface of when it comes to this because it's such a, a broad topic. And that's one of the things I loved about the transpersonal is that it seems like it can be encompassed. It can encompass so much. So in terms of that, I know that when just like we had mentioned in, or just like you had mentioned in the beginning of the interview was this sort of shadow side of things. If it's going to really stand, if the field is going to continue to develop, I think there really needs to be an acknowledgement of the shadow side and of the uh, importance of doing shadow work in the transpersonal, you know, in, within the transpersonal framework or within the transpersonal context and acknowledging that even at the highest levels of consciousness, there's always a shadow side to that. You know, there is the potential for misgivings, misunderstandings. There are dead ends. There are mistakes. There are, or as Ken Wilber would say, pathologies that are still part of this process as we continue to evolve consciously. And so I know that for me, the best way or the most interesting thing that has happened since I was led to the field of corrections and working in a prison was sort of, again, weighing out these two things and saying, all right, now, if my belief in or my faith in, I guess you could say, for lack of a better word, in, in the transpersonal viewpoint is to be held, it's, I got to find a way to make it useful like here, in the here and now, and how would I take this, something that's you know devoted to some of the highest levels of consciousness and bring at least some of that, some of the these kernels of truth and some of these practices to this particular population, because you just would not think that this population would really appreciate that. And so, and, and again, it's just like you said, it's done on a number of ways. Sometimes uh, intellectual, there are certain ideas that I bring. The, the inmates, believe it or not, seem to respond to uh, Jungian psychology quite a bit, archetype, and they love this concept of the shadow. It's been a big concept with them. And I am able to uh, use that concept within the framework of the CBT program, which in, which in I work. So that is helpful. The other piece to that would be how, again, just like you had mentioned earlier, sort of how somebody who studies transpersonal psychology embodies it and how they bring that to their work in terms of attitudes, in terms of perspectives, and in terms of just inspiration. And I think that if anything, and I've, I've gotten this feedback from the inmates that I work with quite a bit, is like, if anything, they know Dr. Morelos is passionate about what he does. And I, and I, really believe that the work, is, it merits that. It merits that kind of passion. I believe it's that important and I believe it's that useful. And so that's really one of the other ways that not to, or to get away from this intellectual idea, but to bring it into a much more embodied sense uh, that transpersonal psychology has really, really helped me. Following up on the, on the earlier question about how, say, the men that you work with there, how they might see or experience you in a different way than someone else. So if you were to compare yourself to a more mainstream traditional corrections officer, would you say that when you look at someone you work with, are you seeing more of them? Are you seeing them more through that transpersonal lens as a more complete human being, as a spiritual being as well, or in contrast to someone, say, who is broken or fell in with a lot of trauma in his background? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I don't know exactly. I'm, I would have to, and you know, and you just gave me a great idea for a future study uh, of correctional workers. You know, anecdotally, what we see happen with a lot of correctional workers over time is, of course, this sort of idea of cynicism. Dealing with this population for any length of time, it's very, very easy to get burned out. It's very easy to become very cynical. And you have the whole spectrum. That's one of the interesting things about working in corrections is that you have people on all different places in terms of people who are invested in the work and see it as useful for society versus people who who don't. <laughs> I, I don't know a, a better way to say it. There are definitely people that I have worked with in the past that probably should not be in this field. It's a very, very challenging field. And there are other people that whom I've learned a ton from a lot from who have showed me how to really keep that balance in life and to sort of understand that 
you can't come in completely naive either. You can't come in with uh, the idea that you're going to change everybody or that you're going to completely overhaul the entire system and make it a more compassionate system or make it a more system that is more just or any of that stuff. One of the, and I'm trying to remember who said it. I'm trying to remember where I read the quote, but it was just that the wisest people start where they are and do what they can. And I've always loved that. I've always thought about that. So in my little tiny nook of the universe, this is sort of what I do. I work with the guys that I can. I try to speak to the ones that I can. And I continually try to keep the perspective of if this one guy stays out of prison, if he doesn't engage in criminal behavior again, how many victims are we sparing out in the world? And then you multiply that by if I touch five guys over the or 10 guys and how many, the sort of butterfly effect, how many people will that affect out in society? I think that for the most part, my studies in the transpersonal and working with people who also do transpersonal work like yourself have really helped me keep that perspective. Like this is important work, Mm -hmm. regardless of how small your little corner of the universe is, there's room for it. And I think that, and it's really needed. And I think that people who are attracted to the transpersonal probably have a drive like that somewhere anyway. That was one of the most beautiful things that I saw when I first came to my first seminar, um, first retreat at Sophia, was this amazing optimism and amazing confluence of ideas and inspiration. And it was one of the best experiences I've ever had academically. I'll say it flat out. That first seminar was just amazing. And I was, again, I knew I had made the right decision instantly, that this is where I really needed to be. It's sort of taking what I've learned from all those people, from the professors and from the material that we studied and throughout that degree, throughout the PhD degree, has really helped me keep that perspective. And I don't know, I would have to ask, and that, you know, that's a good question because now I'm really fascinated with this idea is what really sort of happens and the transformation that correctional workers go through over time. Because unfortunately, we see it doesn't usually turn out that way. It usually turns out it goes the opposite way that after 20 years or 30 years of working with this population, you see tremendous amounts of burnout. You see tremendous amounts of cynicism and a negativity. And, and unfortunately, you see a lot of correctional workers pass away early because of the stress of the job, because of the health issues that come up. We have people that you know wind up with different forms of low-grade PTSD, things like that. It's unfortunate. And so that is a really good topic to explore and sort of how do we keep balance? How do we continue to create meaning in this work? I agree. Maybe that's an opportunity for a future study here coming up. I wanted to go back. I was intrigued by your comment that many of the men that you work with relate to a Jungian perspective on psychology and the archetypes. And that got me thinking about the work of Stanislav Grof with holotropic breathwork and the process that he takes people through, which surfaces and elicits really dark material. I mean, a lot of the dark archetypes come through. I mean, visions of ghoulish visions, this sort of bubbling up from the unconscious. I'm wondering, have you noticed any common patterns or familiar archetypes that come through the men you work with that maybe might be related to trauma or something? Is there anything common there you can put your finger on? Or does it seem to be just what you would expect in the general population? And and the same would be true of also with correction workers, any archetypal material coming through for them. Yeah, another great question. So it's almost cliche working with a lot of the men that I work with in terms of, and when I say cliche, it's just that it's anecdotally universally known that the the men that come from bad situations, they come from bad neighborhoods, they grew up with gangs, they grew up with poverty, they grew up, a lot of uh, have had to deal with abuse, that this is going to create the types of situations that uh, are going to lead them later on that path, down that path of, of criminal behavior. So I see that a lot. I see that a lot. There is a lot of trauma a lot of trauma that leads to this type of lifestyle and these types of criminal choices. In that sense, there's nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. So basically what you would expect to find is exactly what you would find. One of the other things that has been coming up a lot and that I've recently become fascinated with is how men handle grief. 
in different forms of grief. One of the things that tends to come up a lot is how men deal with loss while they're are incarcerated. Because it, it creates such a big feeling of helplessness, particularly for men who are used to dealing with or helping people in what we would call an instrumental way, which is sort of like this idea of doing, you know, I got to do this for somebody or do that for somebody. I can help give money to somebody. I could take this person from here to there or whatever. And one of the opportunities that being incarcerated really opens up for men who are dealing with grief is that they cannot do the instrumental things that they would normally do. So what's left, of course, is emotional, emotional and psychological support. Just reiterating to them, one of the most therapeutic things you can do for somebody when you're on the phone talking to them is to actually be present and to actually really listen to what they're saying. And it's like, it's sort of like this revelation with a lot of these men because they're, they're so used to being doers. Well, I got to do this. I got to do that. Or trying to control their surroundings, things on the outside of them. All of that has suddenly been taken away from them with their incarceration. And so I don't know how to put that into an archetype necessarily, but it's definitely something that has come up in terms of the treatment. And I've only recently within the past year or so started to pay a lot more attention to the crazy things that we do and the crazy ways that grief expresses itself. And I would say that specifically for men because of the way we are brought up, because of the way we are socialized, I think that we have a much, or men have a much harder time expressing that. I don't know if that's true. Uh, you know, I may not argue that that's true for the younger generation, but I think that for the men, probably 35 or up, definitely for my generation, we tend to struggle a lot with that and how we express these types of feelings. So yeah, in terms of an archetype, I'm trying to think of it. I know that, of course, you know, getting back to the shadow, I remember one particular guy and it, he stands out in my head when I was explaining the shadow, because I do a little drawing. One of the things that Dr. Mm -hmm. Morelos is known for, <laughs> I'm kind of famous for at the prison, is that I'm a horrible illustrator. Horrible. And so I draw stick figures and stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, trying to draw this depiction of a shadow. And there was one guy there who we, a colloquialism that we would use is an old con. And, and basically what that means is somebody who's basically spent the majority of their life in and out of prison. And they carry a particular set of values with them that is a result of that. And which is actually what, uh, as you know, was my, well, pretty much what I studied with my dissertation was sort of looking at the changes that men go through over the course of spending a great amount of time in prison. And so this guy, he was definitely, he had been in and out of prison all his life. He, he carried himself like an old con. And that's not in, in the prison, just to clarify, that's not deemed an insult. For us, it may be <laughs> on the outside, but mm -hmm. inside of prison, it's actually a sign of respect to call somebody a convict. It means that they know how to carry themselves in a respectful way within the prison setting. And so I drew this picture of the shadow and I was explaining it and it just seemed he lit up and like it really came together for him. And he was like, oh, okay. He's like, it really, and, and, and this guy's, I mean, I would say he's in his late fifties understanding. And the beautiful thing about the shadow concept. And one of the things I love about it so much, but also one of the most difficult things to try to convey to the men that I work with is that this is not something that can be vanquished. There, there is no defeating mm. the shadow, getting them to sit and hold tension between these different sides, the light side and the dark side, and to acknowledge that you can manage your shadow, you can respect it, you can acknowledge it, and yet never let it completely run the show because some of these guys, they have a lot of darkness in their life. And so getting them to really understand the nuances of being able to manage their shadow dimensions at the same time, Hey, I know you're there and I respect you and I hear you, but I'm the one driving the car. That has been probably the most gratifying part of the work that I do. And I think that that's probably, if I could convey one single message, it would be that and, and that particular archetype. This is something that we will always have to pay attention to. You will always have to give it the respect that it's due, but there are ways that you keep it from running your life. And I think that probably a lot of the criminal behavior that these guys have engaged in, that's what it is. They've let the shadow take over. They sort of let it run amok. And so reining it back in, 
understanding it and really trying to figure out mm. how do I manage this part of myself that is never going to go away and how do I work with it? How do I dance with it per se? I guess that would be the, the better way. Yeah. Of it. How do I do this dance back and forth with this part of me? To be honest, the, the metaphor that I, I really love to use for that is you're driving a car and you've got two unruly kids in the back and every now and then the kids, they get their energy gets to a point where you got to pull the car over. You got to let them get out. You got to let them walk around. You got to let, let them see whatever the roadside attraction is, buy them soda pop or candy or something like that. And then their energy comes down and then you can get back in the car and you can drive away and stuff like that until a few hours later, they're doing it again. So we got to get, we got to pull the car over, let them out, run around, that kind of thing. That's really the way I try to convey the shadow side to the guys that I work with. And it seems to really resonate. There are ways to let this energy out in a healthy, constructive way, still honor it without resorting back to things that are destructive to you or things that are harmful to others. That sounds like very important work, David. And <laughs> I, yeah, and I'm really struck by what your comment about really needing to work with the men on how to handle their grief and loss, which I can imagine being in a prison setting, they've lost a lot not only in their life outside of prison, but then even when, then when they get into prison, everything that they've lost, what a great opportunity to really work on grief. As you were talking, I'm kind of would like to shift the perspective from the individual and the personal aspect of transpersonal psychology, maybe take it outside the prison for a few minutes into our social environment. One of the things I have noticed in research from students at SOFIA and within the discipline is now a shift of focus towards targeting social justice issues as topics of research and really exploring those. So we are in this social milieu of Black Lives Matter and issues of race, issues of gender, issues of the environment, acknowledgement of collective trauma. These are all very important social justice issues, which I see a lot of students beginning to target in particular. I'm wondering if there's anything you're learning there within the prison setting that sheds some light on maybe a transpersonal perspective on these social justice issues. You know, I realize you're seeing you're seeing what happens when people commit crimes and things, and, and here they are in this setting. But I wonder what kind of perspectives that gives you on social justice issues from the transpersonal perspective. That's, uh, that's another interesting question. I know that one of the things that's always fascinated me, you know, when I started diving into the history of uh, corrections was sort of what the whole model was based on. The whole system was originally based on a monastic model. And, it, and the idea was that there's, there are places where you can get away and take retreat and sort of sit and contemplate these sort of things. I've always been fascinated with that idea. What is interesting is that prison can be that way. It can give you an opportunity if you engage it in the correct way to really sort of withdraw from all the craziness and all the things that are going on on the outside and sort of get back to yourself. In that sense, that's what I really appreciate about having worked in this system for as long as that I have is that it's given me a very interesting sort of perspective on the issues that you were just commenting about. In an embodied sense, in an embodied sense, if we are really serious about tackling a lot of the issues of social justice that you just brought up, I think that one of the most important lessons that transpersonal psychology has for us is that we have to deal with ourselves first. We have to acknowledge our own darkness. We have to acknowledge our own responsibility. We have to acknowledge our own, I guess you would say, misgivings or misconceptions and prejudices and the things like that. Really coming back to the self and understanding, all right, if I'm going to understand the darkness of anybody else, I first have to understand my own darkness. That's one of the, I think, really interesting things that working in the prison system has given me is sort of when I work with the darkness of these men, I'm also simultaneously, constantly working with my own darkness. When I'm triggered, I do explorations on that. I, this particular guy is really triggering me. I'm really being triggered by this particular personality type or whatever it is. And when I find myself worn out, when I find myself really getting into that 
sort of cynical mentality, coming back to it and bring coming back to myself, centering myself and looking at, all right, what is this saying about my own complexes? What is this saying about my own darkness? So I think that that's it. I read a story, a journal story. I wish I could give you the exact one. I can't, but it was about an Israeli activist who was protesting a lot of what at the time the Israeli military was doing to Palestinians. And one of the things that she said as an Israeli protesting her own government was fascinating to me, which was she was not really worried about the violence of other people. She was worried about her own potential for violence. And I've, I've always been fascinated with that. And I can see now much more clearly my own potential for that, my own potential for darkness, my own potential for prejudice, my own potential for violence. And I think that that is a huge, huge key when it comes to approaching any of the social justice challenges and the social justice topics that you just mentioned. Are we, when we come to these problems, are we doing it in a way that is truly just and truly wise? Are we doing it in a way that's holistic? And I think that we really have to start with ourselves. That was, again, another one of those things that really drew me to the transpersonal is that you have both. And there are a number of practitioners like yourself who have constantly reminded me, and I know a number of other students at Sophia, that we got to look at ourselves. If we're really going to tackle a lot of these problems, we got to look at ourselves first because we take our darkness with us. Yeah, it does seem almost endemic to the discipline of transpersonal psychology that if you enter the field, you cross this threshold, it basically is saying, if you're really going to pursue this and thrive, be ready to work on yourself. That's it's such a great reminder. Thank you for that. I guess we are setting ourselves up for a lot of personal work. And so what suggestions do you have for people then in terms of inner work of really being open to the darkness? I mean, so so you talk about in your podcast series, Psychology After Dark, serial murderers, uh, you know, all these sort of, the, you know, the really dark side of human nature, you know, massacres, things like this. Is that really part of our nature? Are those things ones that we have to acknowledge that I have a really violent side and I am capable of doing something like that? Is that part of the work that you see? Yeah, another fascinating question. I think that definitely there needs to be an acknowledgement of that side of us. I think that for me, oftentimes that is, and it's it's funny because I'll, I'll do it just the way you sort of presented it there, where I'm working with inmates and I have to remind myself that a few bad decisions or a few pushes in this direction or that direction, and that would be me sitting there and somebody else having this conversation with me. I don't like to believe that I am capable of tremendous acts of violence, but I think that the acknowledgement of it or sort of exploring the potential for it, I think can be tremendously helpful. I think that being honest with ourselves, regardless of whether or not you actually do something like that, that is on par with any, you know, some of the, the, the things that the guys that I work with have actually done in their lives, whether or not we actually do those things or not, but sort of entertaining the idea that there is a potential for that, a potentiality that given the right set of circumstances might be activated. Again, studying Wilbur, you know, when I first started and sort of as you transcend and include the next layer of consciousness, those bottom layers, those more base layers are still always available. They sort of uh, as sleeping sort of potentialities that can be activated depending on the situation. I don't want to think that something bad were to happen and I was thrown into a situation that I would, this shadow side would sort of take over. But I have to acknowledge that is definitely, a, <laughs> there's definitely a chance of it, definitely potential for it. And so I think that acknowledging that is one of the best ways to sort of keep it at bay. When you acknowledge something, it's like you're paying respects to it. You're saying, I definitely understand that you're there. And that in itself helps to manage those dark parts of ourselves and keep them from sort of running the show. So we acknowledge those and we find ways to honor them. We find ways to honor that sort of darkness. I know a Jungian scholar that you and I both appreciate a lot, R.A. Johnson, talks about yes. different ways of acknowledging darkness. And he talks about little ceremonies that he does. When I interviewed Antonio, Antonio Primavera, about uh, Santa Morte, to me, I believe that Antonio would be okay with me saying this about him and his work, but I really believe that his sort of fascination, his honoring of Santa Morte is one of the ways that he really honors his shadow dimension. And I think it's awesome. I think it's fascinating. And I think it's a very beautiful way of doing that without uh, 
becoming so immersed in this darkness that he becomes a drug addict or, or becomes a criminal or anything like that. This is enough. This is what I do. This is how I honor my darkness. And then my darkness then backs off and it allows me to do the work that I need to do. And him, he volunteers as a psychotherapist in Tepito, which is the, the worst of the neighborhoods in Mexico City. And I, I remember he took us there to see the shrine of Santa Morte and very, very rough neighborhood, even for Mexico City, a rough neighborhood, but fascinating in the sense that this is how a lot of Mexicans who worship Santa Morte handle their shadow. We personify it, we give it respect, and it lets us live our lives. She lets us live our lives and do what we need to do. And this is how we honor this shadow dimension. I think that in an overarching sense, psychologically, I think that's really what is going on there. And then that might be a um, <laughs> a very scholarly way of putting it because the worship of Santa Morte is much more embodied than that. And mm -hmm. I think Antonio would, would acknowledge that as well. In terms of tools that people can use or ways to acknowledge this part, I think that, I mean, there are so many different ways. There are, are so many possibilities. A lot of people do it in very embodied ways. Some people do it in much more contemplative ways. It really is, if you find a way to say, okay, this darkness is a part of me and I acknowledge that and I acknowledge that it's never going to go away and you do something, maybe again, that's something that's embodied or something that's more contemplative or in your work or something like that, that sort of symbolizes that. I think that you're on the right path. I think that that was another thing that Jung and Johnson talk a lot about is doing things symbolically. And so what do we do symbolically to say, I honor and I respect this dark part of myself and yet don't let it run the show. And I think that if we were to look at a lot of people, a lot of successful people, I think that you'll find, even if that's not what they call it, you'll find ways that they do this. That would be my own opinion. Yeah. I could be wrong about that, but. <laughs> These are excellent points. And thank you for bringing up the Santa Marte, the work that Antonio Primavera has done. It strikes me what I'm kind of hearing is maybe one of the dangers might be in separating myself from these other people and thinking, oh, you over there, you're the murderer, you're the felon, and I'm over here, I'm the good person. I don't have that in my nature. But really recognizing the common humanity of all of us, that's one of the messages I'm taking away from what you're saying is that, you know, there may be differences between thoughts and behavior. I would suspect everyone at some point has some kind of murderous thoughts going through their mind, right? And so realizing this common humanity, our potential for violence, and being open to that, acknowledging it, and then working with it. And you've given some great examples. I like the idea of working with it symbolically and other ways to kind of integrate those perspectives. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts that you have about how you have personally transformed through this work of transpersonal psychology, bringing it into the prison, doing this work on plumbing the depths of the dark side of human nature? <laughs> yeah, you asked the, uh, the easy questions on the end there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, I think that there's probably no part of me that hasn't been transformed in some way, shape, or form through the study of the transpersonal. I think that every part of me in some way, shape, or form has been touched by it. Individually, I know that it has given me an intellectual voice, I guess you could you could say. I think it's given me a wide range of opportunities to really explore my own intellectual curiosities. It's introduced me to a wide array of very interesting people, very supportive community. And it's given me a lot of perspective, again, on myself, my own darkness, how I work with my darkness. It's always been challenging in that sense as well. It's always challenged me in different ways. And, and just when I think that, okay, I, I get it, you know, I know what's going on here, something else happens or something else comes out and I read something new and it challenges me in a whole different way. And so what I love about the study of the transpersonal is that the potential is unlimited. I think that it really gives a voice to, and this is what I try to bring to the podcast, is that to try to give a voice to elements of the human experience that are generally marginalized. And I think that through the transpersonal, it really gives a voice to these marginalized experiences of transcendence, of spiritual experience, you know, and everything that we've talked about on the podcast, so, you know, out-of-body experiences and things like that. 
how do we honor these things? How do we honor these things as part of the human experience? And so for me, when I came to the transpersonal, it was like, okay, these are my people. These are people who are not going to discount these experiences. And they're actually going to take a real intellectual look at it, a real scholarly look at it. And that was the other thing that it really impressed me, particularly about a lot of the people at Sophia, is that it's rooted in true scholarship. There was nothing easy about the dissertation process, nothing easy. It was meant to be academically rigorous. And so what happens when we take some of these experiences that would be marginalized by contemporary psychology and we say, but okay, let's really take a real scholarly look at them and see what happens. Let's take an academic look at them. And so for me, the transformation, that's the whole part of it. That's the whole key to it. And I sort of didn't understand this when I was at Naropa. I didn't understand the embodied perspective that Naropa continues to try to bring to academia, the experiential side of it. More than anything, intellectual curiosity was a huge part of it. But more than anything, it has been the transformative aspects of the program itself, working and meeting the people that I've been able to work with and the experiences that I've had, the conversations that I've had, and just looking at myself throughout that entire process and sort of growing just as a human being and as a course, you know, as a scholar, as a student, and really taking stock of myself and sort of looking back at the whole process and saying, wow, I grew a lot during that time. I grew a lot. And I think that anybody who would take that on, who takes on this challenge and really comes to the transpersonal will probably say the same thing. I think that that will be their biggest takeaway is how much they have transformed themselves over the course of the experience itself. And again, that's what I, what I love about the transpersonal is that experiential component to it. No question. Well, thank you, David, for these thoughts and these tremendous insights. And in closing, I want to say I really do honor the work that you are doing. You have taken transpersonal psychology and applied it to your own growth and personal and spiritual development, as well as this very important work that a lot of people don't want to do. Working in a prison system as a corrections officer, this is demanding and serious and important work. I want to honor that you're doing that. And then for our listeners, I want to Just say, if you want to follow up on this line of inquiry and research, I encourage you go to psychologyafterdark.com and there you will find a whole series of podcasts on very interesting topics. I predict that everyone will be able to find at least 10 amazing podcasts that draw their attention. For more podcasts, For more information on undergraduate and graduate programs in transpersonal psychology, go to www.sophia.edu. Thank you for listening.